I have once again come here to beg of you to sit here and listen to me yap about the waiver wire pickups of the upcoming week for fantasy football. Week four is upon us. And I'll tell you what, the waiver wire excitement is not slowing down. We have, I would say, two to three key players, players that I think will make massive impacts over the remainder of the year that y'all need to keep your eye on. And as always, we've got a bunch of fool's gold. So we're going to hop into Sleeper, look at the trending tab, talk about the most popular ads of the week, as well as the most popular drops of the week. Y'all know what are y'all. Tuck your shirt in. The hoodie tuck under a belt. Wild. We get wild out here, though. Get it. First things very first, however, we just launched our new membership site yesterday. It's got a fresh, new, beautiful, clean look. All the team members down there, you know, me and Bijan, we're good friends. We make a lot of jokes in the office, you know, when we get into the kitchen. We talk about last night's games, things like that. You guys know. You guys know that office chatter going on on the membership website. Right now, we've got our weekly rankings. It's the only place to actually cop the rankings. We've got our waiver wire rankings, which relevant to this video will give you fab suggestions for every single player. It also ranks them succinctly by position, flex overall, every single position you got. Just a nice little uh, redone, clean site for you guys. I mean, we've got testimonials with Eddie Lacy up in here. This is just what he said. This is not my words. These are his words. I normally wouldn't put that type of unpolitical uh, characteristic nature of, of a testimonial onto the website, but he did. So I thought it we'd be genuine and transparent and, and just throw it up there for you. So uh, check this out on bdge.co. This is also where you will get access to our private Cune Assault live streams. Only members, only signed up members will get access to this YouTube live stream every single Saturday. I sit there half hour, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever, answer all of y'all's questions, whether it's waiver wire or trades or sit start questions or life, love, liberty, the pursuit of tucking your shirt in. All of it's there for you. All right. So bdge.co just freshly launched. Go check it out. Become a member, and we'll see you in the Discord. Bike to our regularly scheduled programming here. We are inside a sleeper league. This is one of my redraft leagues, and we are inside the trending tab. So you can see who have been the most added players over you know the last 24 hours, who have been trending. And you can see it right here. We've got some, some really sexy-looking players. Obviously, with Mike Williams on the flip side, we've got two chargers on the flip side. We've got Mike Williams getting dropped at the highest rate. Obviously, he tears his ACL. So it opens up the question. It begs the question, man, Josh Palmer or Quentin Johnston? feels very obvious to me that the Chargers like Josh Palmer. Don't know if they love him, but they like him enough that he's going to be a staple of this team. He was a dude who, up until yesterday, was playing around 70% of the snaps and running 70% of the routes. Now, I wanted to go back and, like, Palmer's, he's just mid, man. As the TikTok people say, he's a, he's a mid player, right? It's not great. It's not terrible. He just does his job. Do so you have to ask yourself, would you rather, you know, a staple eight PPR points per game with the occasional 14 or 15 point game? Or would you rather the potential upside of a first round rookie like Quentin Johnson? Now, Quentin Johnson was really intriguing, interesting player coming out of TCU. He was in terms of skill set, just looking at the rawness, the very, very raw player that he is he feels like uh, a little bit of a combination between Keenan Allen and uh and Mike Williams he's a guy who can make plays down the field he's big he's, he's very tall he's very lanky but he could work on the edge on the perimeter and make like sky high catches where he ends up on the highlight reel he's also extremely shifty at the line of scrimmage for someone his size you don't see dudes built like AJ Green who get off the line in the same way that Quentin Johnson does so there's a lot of upside the question becomes, is he ready to 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 get into that upside? I, the Chargers clearly didn't feel like he was at this point. He was running with the twos all summer long, all preseason game. I was listening to a podcast this morning from The Athletic where they actually brought a Chargers beat reporter on, someone who's really close to the team who does great work. And he was like, yeah, the Chargers wanted nothing more than to be able to sit Quentin Johnson for, you know, a very large portion of the year. They felt like he was a little bit raw. He wasn't ready to kind of get shoved into the spotlight. They don't have a choice at this point, though. They don't have a choice. He's going to run the most routes. So you got to ask yourself, do I want to take the risk on the upside of Quentin Johnson versus Joshua Palmer? And I think that might be a little bit team dependent for you. You know, if you are looking for something steady, just like a nice produce producer at the flex spot, I think Josh Palmer will be fine. He'll ebb and flow with the offense uh, that the Chargers have right now. Herbert's obviously clicking. Uh, 
I don't know if I even want to go as far as saying clicking. He had a great game, but it was against the worst defense in the NFL probably. So obviously we all feel really good about Palmer coming off this game. We all feel really good about Herbert. I'm going to be honest, though. I think forced into a position to to be the guy in in the Chargers offense, I think I like Quentin Johnson more than I like Josh Palmer. I think Quentin Johnson is a better complement to Keenan Allen. Now, what else was interesting in the podcast I listened to today was the beat reporter was pretty insistent that Keenan Allen's production is going to go down pretty significantly without Mike Williams. And, you know, on the surface, like you'd ask, you'd say, okay, Keenan Allen just had fucking 20 targets in a game. How many was he going to get? 26 next game, 28 next game, 47 next game. Obviously it's going down, but point remains sure. The volume might be up there, but teams, the way that they were actually running Mike Williams, his slot percentage went up. I don't want to say like super significantly, but almost it was an almost 100% increase rate. He went from like a 13% slot guy last year up to around 27 to 30% this year, which is more than double. And that allowed Keenan Allen to be on the outside. And when you have a guy like Mike Williams on the inside, you have to have a lot of coverage uh, coming over the top from uh, Mike Williams, like working in the middle, if that makes sense. But the, the beat reporter is basically saying like there was no way that teams could double Keenan Allen, right? And he was getting a lot of like one-on-one uh, type of coverage on the outside. And Keenan Allen being the route runner that he is, excels with that stuff. He's going to have way more pressure on him, which opens up the door for Quentin Johnson or Josh Palmer. I do think like he was taking a lot of shots down the field to Mike Williams. I think it's way more likely that Quentin Johnson gets those shots than Josh Palmer. Maybe not immediately, but I think over the uh, the course of a season, right? We're only in week four right now. We still have 12, 13, 14 weeks left until uh, the end of the season. And it might take three, four, five weeks for Quentin Johnson to really get up to speed. But I think at the end of the year, that's the guy that you're likely going to want. That's the guy I'd rather gamble on. So when I'm looking at these numbers and uh, don't don't get like caught up in the fact that Palmer's number one, this is just raw ad drops uh, over the last 24 hours. And the reason for the high numbers, because clearly Palmer was way less owned. So Quentin Johnson was a dude who was drafted in basically every redraft league. Um, he was already 50% owned before the day started, right? So obviously just in terms of raw volume, which is what this is filtered by, he's going to be a lot lower on the risk because there's a lot uh, a lot lower on the list because there's a lot fewer leagues that have the capability to actually pick him up because he's already owned. So uh, Josh Palmer, Quentin Johnson, I actually have of the dudes that were available on the Fantasy Pros waiver wire, uh, when you go to our website and you subscribe, the waiver wire rankings are listed via fantasy pros where they give you a template of guys and you rank them that way i actually have quentin johnson as the number two receiver this week i have zay jones as the number three if he's available and then josh palmer as the number four but the guy right beneath him of course we're going to talk about devon a chain the guy right beneath him with with with, uh, quentin johnson in terms of fab though like josh palmer and quentin johnson i have them kind of in the same tier i think i would drop anywhere from like 12 to 15 percent on either guy but if i had to break the budget and go like 15 on one, 13 on the other, I would give the tiebreaker to Quentin Johnson because he's young. We see rookies explode the second half of the year. This is kind of like the prototype of a guy who would break out and be, I don't want to go as far as saying a league winner, but an L-dub, an L-dub type of player, Quentin Johnson. The athleticism in an offense that is throwing the ball like they are right now, that's why I, I would simply just put the money on the upside there. So maybe 15 on Quentin Johnson, 13 on Joshua Palmer, end up with who you end up with. You know what I'm saying? They are my... Two and four. Zay Jones is the three if he's available in your league. But Tank Dell. Tank Dell is is clearing away my number one here. Tank Dell is becoming CJ Stroud's uh, like go-to playmaker. And Stroud has looked phenomenal up to this point. Stroud has looked as advertised as the number two pick should be advertised and then come through with on his advertisements. He's looked poised in the pocket despite not having his offensive lineman there blocking for him. He's barely been taking sacks. He's making quick decisions. He's throwing it accurately at all in every fucking quadrant of the field. So uh, I really, really like how Stroud has looked, and Tank Dell has been such a big beneficiary of that when you start to look at the stats. 20-point PPR games, back-to-back games, two out of the first three rookie games. There are probably not that many rookie wide receivers that fall onto the list of having 20 or more PPR points in their first three games, two out of three. He's had a touchdown in back-to-back games. He has made big plays in back-to-back games. He has just looked every bit of the explosiveness that he had coming out of college. I've used this um, comparison before since dating back to like February, March, when I first started looking at rookie tape. It, when you watch Tank Dell, because he went to a small school, when you watch him, it, it, it felt like you were watching like a high school varsity player in gym class. It felt like he was just a different type of athlete than everybody else on the field. And sometimes that doesn't transfer over to the NFL level, but it is very clearly transferring over. They saw it really, really, 
I mean, I'm not going to say they saw it quickly because they needed to see fucking Noah Brown go down in order to put Tank Dell in the lineup at a serious capacity, which is like NFL execs, bro. Like NFL coaches, the, 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 the shit that they get away with, bro, the shit that they get. A- Unbelievable. Either way, he's in the lineup now, and he's running 70% of the routes. He looks great. CJ Stroud loved him coming out of college. So Tank Dell is a dude that needs to be – he is my number one wide receiver waiver pickup of the week, and I would blow 25% of my fab on him. Um, he is a staple of this offense, an offense that's clearly going in the right direction. You want to talk about being in a division of teams that you get to play six times throughout the year? Indy's perimeter cornerbacks are terrible. The Jaguars, overall, have looked terrible. Can't get a goddamn pass rush going. You have the Tennessee Titans, who have a great run defense, one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL as well. So, like, you, you, a lot of the times you, you talk about players and you're like, ah, he gets these really, really tough divisional matchups. Fam, he gets the opposite of that. So there are many big games coming from Tank Dell going forward. Now, sandwiched in between Palmer and Tank Dell is the obvious pickup of the week, Devon A. Chain. He might have been dropped by a lot of people because he didn't play at all the first two weeks. He was injured for a lot of the summer. But good Lord, did... Mike McDaniel had the Dolphins humming on Sunday, made an embarrassment out of the Denver Broncos, clapped them cheeks to a degree in which no bedroom should ever experience. And Devon A. Chain ripped off 200, I don't know, 30 total yards from scrimmage, scored four times, breaking away, showcasing that 4-3 speed that we knew about going into the season. And again, I mentioned this, you know, some sometimes I just be saying the same shit from the live stream yesterday. I do a full game-by-game game live stream of every game that happened. So apologies if you listen to that and then you come listen to this and I say the same shit over and over again. What am I going to do? Start making up lies? I ain't doing it. I keep it 99. I'd be lying sometimes. So Raheem Mostert, like going back to draft season, right? Again, February, March, I made a a full video just breaking down Devon A-Chain. Just absolutely phenomenal thumbnail. Throw it up on the screen, Tony, and we'll link it down below if you want to watch it. But my takeaway from Devon A-Chain, despite being 180 pounds and despite being that size and all that kind of shit, he is such a good in-between-the-tackles runner. He has great vision, and obviously he's got Olympic-level burst. But he is so much better of a runner than you would imagine an 180-pound running back being. Um, so this dude is legit. He's not going anywhere. And it's clear to me, I don't care what the garbage time stats were in this game. He was in there early. He, he will be the 1B to Raheem Mostert for now, but I think they'll utilize both guys to a very high degree throughout the next month of the season, if not more. Who's more likely to still be a living, breathing running back by the end of the year, probably Devon A-Chain over Raheem Mostert, given his lengthy injury history. I think they are both startable players right now. Raheem Mostert's an RB1, no doubt about it, until we see anything that says otherwise. Devon A-Chain, I think, could absolutely be startable. I don't know how you could watch him play and watch the Miami Dolphins play over the uh, over the weekend and not think that he's a flex-worthy start at the minimum. Now, Jeff Wilson, he is on the pup list. He can come off the pup list after week four. I am not sure what to make of the situation. I think there are two ways to look at it. One, if any of you guys read the comments from Mike McDaniel after he got put on the pup list, Mike, the words were weird. They 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 had a weird a weird sus vibe to him. He was like, "Yeah, I'm hopeful that he can play again this season." So the way he said it made it seem like it was a really serious injury with no real timetable for return. Then I think Jeff Wilson's agent came out and been like, yeah, his finger and his back just need to heal or something. So I feel like when they came out, when he came out and said it, it was his agent being like, yeah, he'll be back week five. But it was Mike McDaniel making it sound kind of eerie. So I would do a little I I would dig into a little more research right now. Okay, yeah. So so I did some more digging. Right. And this is this is the words from Mike McDaniel. He got placed on the IR at the end of August. It's a midsection injury compounded by some finger issues, he said. We made the assessment he couldn't protect himself and couldn't be himself the way we know him to be. I wouldn't be surprised if he would make a return this season. We will let his body tell us. That's really weird. For an injury that's supposed to be like a month, wouldn't be surprised if he made a return this season. That feels weird to me. I'm, I, you know, I don't want to like jump to conclusions here, but then when you look at when you look at the other one, um, Drew Rosenhaus. Drew Rosenhaus is his fucking agent. Uh, I would imagine he's saying that you know, uh, for any number of reasons, it could be so that like if Jeff Wilson is the big pounder there in Miami, wasn't going to be back until week 10 or 14 or 16. Maybe it raises the chances that Miami trades for a guy like Jonathan Taylor. But if you tell him he's back week four or five, then maybe the team doesn't need him as much. That really is irrelevant at this point, obviously. But I'm just trying to figure out based on all the, the spoken words coming out pre pre Jeff Wilson IR, what's real here. Um, So anything could really happen just because he is eligible to return in week five does not mean he's going to be ready to go in week five. 
So I'm kind of of the opinion right now that Jeff Wilson probably makes less of an impact on this lineup than a lot of people are kind of like talking about on podcasts right now. I just feel like why why go elsewhere besides Zamane Chain or Raheem Mostert? They're both banging on the goal line. They're both doing really, really well. Uh, this will probably be a 1A, 1B for the for the rest of the season, in my opinion, but I probably want both of them in my starting lineup. Devontae Chain is the clear pickup number one on the waiver wire this week, and I would go as high as like 50% of my fab budget, depending on what I have left. But I would put a lot of money on Devon A-Chain if he's available, and I have fab to spend. Now, as I play in a lot of super flex leagues, I think there will be a question of uh, quarterbacks right now. You might play in a 10-team league where like CJ Stroud is available, and if he's available in a super flex league, even like a 12-team league, probably was picked up last week, but he's a dude I would I would legitimately also spend 50% of my fab plus in a super flex league if I need a quarterback on. He is a, a priority pickup. If you're in a one QB league and maybe you've been starting like Justin Fields, I would throw 5% of the fab on Stroud and kind of just continue letting him rip. There will be questions about Jameis Winston, no doubt about it. Jameis Winston is a dude who, I'm going to be honest, like Derek Carr's injury, uh, I listened to a few injury podcasts today. It's it's a pain tolerance thing. Uh, realistically, a lot of the people I listened to today were like, I'm not ruling Derek Carr out from this upcoming game. They said they'd be surprised if he played, but they're not ruling him out. So it kind of feels like Derek Carr's injury is not going to last him. Like Derek Carr is a relatively tough dude. It probably won't last that long. So I'm not going all in on Jameis. And yeah, I was pretty vocal yesterday about Jameis. Like I, 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 people are going to say it's not that big of a drop off. I tend to disagree. I think it is that big of a drop off for this offense. And I think Winston is really like capable of putting up huge statistical numbers anymore. The dude just looks, you know, permanently rusty every time he gets onto the field. It's just, it's just not really great. So you might have him for a week. You might have him for three weeks. I don't really know. I'm just like not overly excited about him. So I wouldn't really put more than like 10 to 12% of my fab on him for Superflex Leagues. As we move down, we've got the dichotomy between Adam Thielen and DJ Chark. Now, DJ Chark made his return pretty much this game and had his first like balling out game. I think he went four for 86, scored a touchdown. Okay, so he returned last week, but then he finally like got into the lineup as a full-time player this week. 11 targets, 4 catches, 86 yards, and a touchdown. So we're talking about 21 and a half yards per catch. This is like not too dissimilar. Like you might think Adam Thielen still got it going on, and I get it, but like, don't forget, he also went 2 for 12 in game 1 with Bryce Young. Um, he did just pop off, but Seattle is also like, I mean, this goes for both guys. Seattle is is an atrocious defense right now, especially with Tariq Woolen out uh, in this one. They're a really bad pass defense right now, so also important to take that into account. Between the two, I, I know like this will be an unpopular opinion. I would take Chark over Adam Thielen. I just give me the younger, more explosive playmaking guy in an offense that so badly lacks juice. They do play Minnesota, which is, of course, a super beatable um, defense. I will take DJ Chark over Adam Thielen. But again, I'm not like this is uh, an offense that next week can put up fucking 11 points. And everyone's like, fuck, why did I start these guys? They scored me six points. So you factor that in when you go through the spectrum of like how much fab am I going to spend on a specific player for me? Like both of those guys, I'd be, I, I would spend fab on both of those guys, right? I would spend fab on both Chark and Thielen, but it probably wouldn't go above actually going to check my waiver rankings right now on the site and see where I have them at. So I have DJ Chark ranked right above him. I have Chark as a seven to 10% fab spend. And then I have Adam Thielen as a five to 8% fab spend. So that's kind of how I break up the tiers. It's less about like, I guess the one or 2% fab spend, but they're, they're kind of ranked in order of tiers on the waiver wire site. There's not a ton of other like interesting players to really talk about. Laporte is really highly owned. Obviously, he's a smash tight end pickup. Marvin Mims is still not really running any routes. He continues to make huge explosive plays. He he is someone I would definitely stash if I have room on my bench because it's only a matter of time before Sean Payton starts to play him because he keeps making plays week after week after week. He is playing behind Judy and Cortland Sutton. If they keep uh, just nose diving this team, there's a chance that they just move Sutton or Jerry Judy for future picks. Mims will probably be the wide receiver that steps in for them and he was Sean Payton's guy he was like his draft pick so I'm sure he wants to kind of like ramp him up to be that dude Josh Downs has kind of like securely become the wide receiver two there behind Michael Pittman he's getting a shit ton of targets 12 targets last game eight catches 57 yards he's not really making any downfield explosive plays but he's extremely sure-handed and I'm sure he'll get into the end zone uh, eventually a lot of these guys are all really highly owned. I would definitely hold on to Jaden Reed. He had a couple boneheaded drops, but I mean, he's been producing like a, not like a rookie. Christian Watson should probably be back as well as Aaron Jones this week for a good matchup against Detroit. But Jaden Reed's a dude that I want on my roster um, for sure. 
Calvin Austin's deep target was was relatively fluky. Baltimore, Gus Edwards is dealing with a concussion. Uh, so Melvin Gordon played 40% of the snaps, but he looked terrible. Their offensive line is really, really banged up. They play at Cleveland, which is like arguably the toughest, arguably the toughest defense just overall in the league. And apparently Melvin Gordon goes back to the practice squad. So they reverted him back to the practice squad after the game. I'm not sure if that means Gus Edwards is not actually in the concussion protocol anymore. Um, they also do have Kenyon Drake, who's been kind of like a thorn in the side of a lot of running backs there. So there's no one on the Baltimore backfield that I really want to put money into. The only other guy I'd probably sprinkle a few dollars on that sits here is Rashi Rice. He continues to get a lot of like the first reads from Mahomes. A lot of the non-Travis Kelsey first reads go to Rashi Rice, the rookie. Uh, we saw seven targets, five catches, 59 yards. Not a lot of high upside games from the receivers in this offense, ironically, but he's probably a dude that I feel like could be second one up in the offense. Now, as we go through the drop list, we go through the drop list. All I ask before, if you have been enjoying the video, Hit the button that looks like this right underneath it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new, obviously. Tomorrow, we're doing a really fun video, actually. Tonight, we're going to film. Uh, Alex Caruso will be in the city. So me, him, and J-Mo are refilming a fantasy draft. Like, we are redrafting fantasy teams, all three of us, knowing what we know now. So if we were to start doing a fantasy draft right now, how would we pick them? Uh, so that, that'll be really fun. So that will take place instead of the trade target video that we've been doing on Wednesday. So subscribe and stay tuned for that. Uh, coming tomorrow to you on the trending downside obviously you drop Mike Will Josh Kelly he's so bad he's so bad why is he so bad right now they play Vegas you could run on them but Dallas is tough KC's tough shit yeah. I don't know dude I, I still there's something in me that still wants to hold on to Kelly someone please convince me otherwise please convince me otherwise Josh Reynolds he was dealing with a groin injury but he's been like really really solid in this offense so I, he's a guy that I would hold on to as well Tony has been a drop I never suggested picking him up Tony Jones is absolutely a drop with Kamara coming back Zach Ertz is another dude who had trouble against the Dallas defense which is tough but was getting significant targets prior to that so Ertz is not a guy I would I would too quickly drop Juju should have been dropped years ago Kendra Miller I might I might I might bitch I might hold on to Kendra for one more game with Kamara to see what that split finally looks like. So he's a hold for me. Traylon Burks, absolutely droppable just based on this Tennessee offense and how bad it is. Uh, if you need the spot, you could drop Burks. Jahan Dotson, I would definitely hold on to still. Better days ahead for him. Donald Mooney, I don't care anything about that Chicago offense, so that goes the same with Khalil Herbert. Rashid Jaheed, I would definitely hold on to as well. He's been a really dynamite playmaker so far this year for them. Samaja Pirine, interesting. So I have him on my team, so I can make the decision. I actually have a waiver claim in, I believe. See, the people in my league will watch this video probably, so I don't want to put it on air. But let's just say I have a waiver claim in, and this is my team. You guys could see my team. Herbert, and listen, Josh Kelly's only in there because Aaron Jones is banged up, so fuck off. Aaron Jones, James Cook, the rest of my team, though. Diggs, Devontae Smith, Tyler Lockett. This is full PPR, and then tight end premium. And Superflex, of course. So this is the team. I have P. Ryan Kelly, Jalen Warren, Jahan Dotson, Romeo Dobbs, Rashid Shahid on the bench right now. I am looking to make a waiver wire pickup, and uh, Samaja P. Ryan is the guy I am dropping. But I'd also be fine dropping Josh Kelly, and that's probably about it. These two are the only ones I'd be looking to drop in this scenario. Even though P. Ryan against Chicago is kind of a good matchup, and he probably has a higher floor than Josh Kelly at this point. So maybe I'll rethink that one, but... Breda, I, I would give Breda another go. I mean, he scored a touchdown last week, and now they get Seattle, which, again, is an, an awful defense. So I think he could have, like, a sneaky good game. Bateman is for sure droppable. Gibson fumbled again. You can get him all the way off your team. Cooks had his first game back, had seven targets, did not really look good. But they got a tough matchup against New England. They got a tough matchup at San Francisco. Good matchup against the Chargers, but then they're on a bye uh, I, I would hold on to Brandon Cooks, but if you if you're in like a shallower league where there's a lot of better available players on the wire, like I would pick up probably either of the Chargers wide receiver over Brandon Cooks. Yeah, and I think the rest of these guys for the most part are droppable. Let me see. I'd probably hold on to JSN because I think if you drafted him, you were probably waiting for the second half of the year anyways. Robert Woods is a decent PPR play still. I'd hold on to Algier. Maybe this is how we'll do it. Anyone that I don't name, I would drop. Algier, I'd hold on to. Kareem Hunt, I'd probably disgustingly hold on to. Dalton Kincaid, I think there's a sneaky chance he has a big game just because in order to keep up with Miami, they're going to have to. Kenneth Gainwell did get like 16 touches. I know a lot of it was was garbage time, so I'd probably hold on to Kenneth Gainwell. Zay Jones, we are holding on to, people. We're holding on to Zay Jones. And I, I guess I'd hold on to Ro Roshan Johnson if I could, but like also not a super desperate peace of mind to hold on to. Do we need some defense? Uh, the Steelers are the most added team. I think on paper they look okay, but 
They're playing at Houston. They're not a good defense to begin with. I, w- I would actually be kind of surprised if Steelers are even a favorite in this game. The way I look at streaming defenses is I want my team to be projected to win, first of all, per Vegas lines. If they're at home, great. If they are, if it's a big over-under, I want the spread to be big. So if the over-under is like 54 points, but they're like minus 10, we love that because that means a lot of passing from the opposing teams, which means a lot of sacks, a lot of forced fumble opportunities, a lot of interception opportunities. We want turnovers. New Orleans Saints versus Tampa Bay. I kind of like this a little bit. Um, they've been a really good defense all year, and I, I don't know if I necessarily believe in the Tampa Bay offense, but they're at home, so that's a nice game for them. You guys should have picked up Kansas City last week. They were my favorite uh, waiver wire pickup of the week, and now they get rewarded again with the Jets matchup. All right, so I think we're going to wrap up there. So if you enjoyed and you want to support the brand, the number one way to do that is to sign up to become a Big Dog member. This is going to be our only product that we actually provide for you guys anymore. All of our draft guides, all of our rookie rankings, everything that we create for the Dynasty community in the offseason will be part of this membership. So everything we do product-wise will be a part of this membership. We will just continue to build it and make it better and take feedback from you guys to um, to give you something that you really want. We are only building things that you guys want from here on out. So if y'all hungry, busy. eat.